I wanted to bring this episode again to the podcast because this is the episode that I refer everyone to. When someone asks, where do I start when I'm on the fertility journey? What should I do? I'm not sure. I refer them to this episode, how and why to do the elimination diet and why it's so important to do this with your partner. We're taking you through the exact steps. I tell you exactly how to do it. And then also make sure that you access that free recipe guide. And that gives you the actual recipes, meal plan, grocery shopping list to get started. So I highly suggest that you select a date and yes, it can suck, but you can do anything for 10 days, suck it up, do it, get it done, see how it feels, reintroduce the foods with your partner. Then you'll realize either the power of food that can harm you or actually heal you and prepare your body for pregnancy success. Excited for you to listen to this episode. Let's go. Are you stuck in a food rut? Not sure exactly what to eat to enhance your fertility? I'm excited to announce that our summer fertility recipe guide is ready. All you need to do is go to fertilitydietfreebie.com to grab your free copy. And your free guide includes a meal plan, grocery shopping list, and everything you need to get started with nourishing foods that improve your chances of pregnancy success. All you need to do is go to fertilitydietfreebie.com. That's F-E-R-T-I-L-I-T-Y-D-I-E-T-F-R-E-E-B-I-E.com, fertilitydietfreebie.com. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently. I was still cycling back in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's an assumption. You can't test egg quality. Many times it's the man. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or the zinc deficiency. There can be a root cause to these quote unquote period problems. The doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. Why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone on the fertility journey, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming back to the podcast, Brandy Buscow, and we're digging into why an elimination diet is essential when you're trying to conceive. So this episode is for you if you've tried making changes to your diet, but you didn't notice any improvement, so you gave up. You're already dairy and gluten-free, and so is your partner, but you are still not pregnant. You've made all the changes to your diet, but your partner is still eating his regular diet. So definitely check out episode number six for a functional medicine one-on-one talk plus a look at some of the tools we use to help couples conceive. So Brandy is part of my team here at Fab Fertile. She's an integral part of our couples coaching program, which uses functional lab testing, diet and lifestyle changes to dramatically improve conception. So if you are struggling with infertility, your body is desperately trying to tell you something and focusing on your health will either help you get pregnant naturally, or if you do need to go to the fertility clinic, it will improve your chances of success. Brandy is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, certified transformational health coach, and emotional freedom technique practitioner, so tapping. She loves supporting women so they can learn how functional medicine addresses the underlying cause of disease or illness. And again, thanks so much for listening. I'm really thankful that you are here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Welcome back to the show, Brandy. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me again. Awesome. Cool. So Today, we're going to be digging into elimination diet, which is uh, one of my favorite topics. So really, I guess we'll kind of start with obviously people that we work with, they present with us, and it's mainly women that come to us, even though with infertility, 60% is female and 40% is male factor. Typically, we work with unexplained infertility, high FSH, low AMH, premature ovarian failure, low ovarian reserve are kind of the, the main ones we work with. And we also work with women that have PCOS, fibroids, and endometriosis. For really in functional medicine, we don't treat the diagnosis, we look at the whole body. Anything you want to add to that, Brandy? Yeah, for sure. So everything that you just described is essentially you've gone to your doctor and your specialist, you've tried to get pregnant and you haven't been able to, and they've diagnosed you with these specific things. But really, 
it's not the diagnosis that's the problem. There's a whole bunch of underlying things that have led up to this specific diagnosis. And so when we work with people and we coach them using a functional approach, that's what we look at. We look at all of the underlying stressors or things that have gone on in your life that could have contributed to this specific diagnosis. And we help you work on all of those underlying factors. Yeah, absolutely. And really, even if you're presenting with infertility, there's other health issues. I, we have yet to see someone just come in with infertility. There's other health issues going on. So I'm going to list some of them here. Some of the ones that we, that we typically see. So under the heading of digestive problems. So we see constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux, you know, even belch, burping, gas. Those are all signs. Anything you want to add in the digestive side of things, Randy? No, and a lot of people think that these are common and it's really a sign from your body that something is out of balance and something isn't right. So even if you occasionally have re acid reflux or occasionally have bloating or constipation, these are signs that something is imbalanced. Exactly. And so then mood problems, we would be the next one. So things like anxiety, panic attacks, depression, ADHD, definitely check out episode uh, number two, Brandy Wool. She, she goes through her personal story with, uh, she suffered from uh, anxiety for, for years and was able to then heal with the tools of functional medicine. Yeah, for sure. And unfortunately, this is something that we're seeing more and more these days is a lot of the people that come to us have some degree of what people would consider a mood problem. And it's just because we have so many things that are bombarding us these days that there's no wonder that we feel anxious or panicky or inattentive and inability to concentrate. I mean, there's just so much going on now that we didn't have to deal with before. Yeah, the standard Western diet and lifestyle. And then also there could be gut infections going on as well. Skin problems. So for, for myself, I had like this great skin through when I you know, was a teenager. All of a sudden in my early 20s, I started getting acne. So acne, eczema, which I had as a baby, psoriasis. So those dermatitis skin rashes can be a clue uh, in functional medicine for us to dig further. A lot of people actually that come to see us, they've even used Accutane. So when they were younger as a teenager, they had horrible acne and they were given Accutane, which then can potentially mess with your microbiome or your gut flora. And in some instances, and this was the case for myself, I was on tetracycline, which is an antibiotic for two years straight to treat acne as a teenager. And that's something that's not very uncommon. And we now know that the use of antibiotics long-term, I mean, even short-term, causes a lot of problems with the gut and can cause food sensitivities and leaky gut and a whole host of symptoms. The next one we have is joint problems. So if you're having joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, those are clues. Sometimes we think we're just, you know, we're stiff and it's normal to wake up feeling this way. Well, that's again, your body's trying to tell you something that's something we need to dig a little further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, occasionally we will have these things if we work out too hard, but if you're always waking up and you're really stiff or you always have pain. Again, it's a clue. Sarah likes to say our body whispers to us by giving these, these little symptoms. And then after a while, when you stop listening, and you don't hear those whispers, then you get a whole bunch of symptoms that create disease and you get a diagnosis. So it's important for us to kind of take a step back and look at all of these little minor things that we think is not a big deal and realize that these are clues that our body is giving us that something isn't right. They're all connected. It's a holistic approach. And the last one we have is autoimmune disease. So multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, which is the case for Brandy, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, Graves, lupus. We see a lot of people that come to us that, that have thyroid issues and sometimes, yeah, ha uh, Hashimoto's. So those are clues. For sure. And I mean, the diagnosis of an autoimmune disease, again, is the culmination of there was probably many years of symptoms that went unnoticed or undiagnosed that led up to the actual diagnosis of the disease. And you may have heard about leaky gut and sometimes the root cause of some of the complaints that we just mentioned is due to leaky gut. So we'll have Brandy just kind of explain leaky gut a little bit to us. Sure. So this is a term that many people may have been hearing a lot recently, especially in functional medicine or alternative practitioners. And essentially what leaky gut means is if we imagine a cheesecloth, it's got little tiny holes in it. And if we imagine our gut as a cheesecloth, those tiny holes are a healthy gut that allow just the right amount of nutrients to pass through the gut wall as we're digesting them and into our body to be used as nutrition and repair and for all of the systems and activities that our body needs these nutrients for. 
But when we have a leaky gut, what happens is those holes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so like we're poking these bigger holes in that cheesecloth. And so larger particles of the foods that we're eating are passing through the gut wall. And because they're larger, the immune system doesn't recognize them and it thinks it's an invader. And the immune system gets on high alert and starts attacking it and creates a cascade of symptoms like inflammation. And then we start getting the symptoms like we just read, uh, digestive mood problems, skin issues joint issues. And so there are many things that can lead to leaky gut. Stress is the number one thing. And we all have stress in our lives. Well, an overabundance of stress, whether it's mental, emotional stress, physical stress, like you've had a car accident, environmental stress. So the toxins that we're exposed to in our environment, it could be stress like insulin being high all the time. So if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates and your blood sugar is going up and down constantly, that is a stress on the body. The foods that you're eating. So if you're eating foods that your body is just innately sensitive to, that is a stress as well. And so all of these things, when combined together over a prolonged period of time, can lead to a leaky gut. And then we start to have symptoms and the symptoms, if they're not rectified and we don't start healing the gut, we start then getting to the point where the symptoms are so severe that we get diagnosed with the disease. Yeah. So there's mental, emotional stress, the physical stress, obviously structural stress. Sometimes you could have something in your body that's out of alignment, the environmental toxins, which we always suggest people to look at their personal care and their, their cleaning applies and switch to more uh, natural options. As you said, insulin. So those are some underlying causes. And what about, we always recommend everyone to look at 100% organic, switch that and make sure you're not having any GMOs. But what about glyphosate, which is a herbicide used, which is sort of Roundup. What yeah. is, is a herbicide used? What about the connection with that with leaky gut? So there's a lot of studies that have come out recently linking glyphosate exposure, which almost all of us are exposed to, and how it disrupts the normal bacteria in the gut. So we are more bacteria and pathogens than we are normal human cells. We know that's been proven. And we need to have these microbes here. They're important. They do a lot of processes in the body. They create B vitamins. They help with enzymes and digestion and keep our immune system healthy. But when we ingest glyphosate, there are, like I said, studies now showing that the glyphosate is causing a radical disruption in this microbiome that we have and creating imbalances where it's affecting our good microbes that are supposed to be there to keep us healthy, lowering those and allowing the bad pathogens then to now come in and take over and overgrow. And that's where we start getting things like parasite or pathogenic bacterial infections, which then lead to leaky gut and symptoms. And so although you'll see some things out there that Monsanto, who creates Roundup and glyphosate, they say they've done studies and they've showed that it is safe. The fact is we're starting to see now that it indeed isn't, and it is creating an issue and the purpose of glyphosate, really, if you, if you look at the purpose of it, is they created these genetically modified crop that they could spray with glyphosate so that when the pests or the, or the insects that were attacking the crop, when they ingest it or ingest any part of the plant, the glyphosate basically makes the bug guts explode, essentially. Mm -hmm. and toxin, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's doing that to the bugs that are potentially attacking these crops, how is that not affecting us as humans? Why do you think we have the, the digestive issues around the rise? If it's exploding the bugs intestines, what is it doing to our, our digestive system? Exactly. And so I think we're, we're at a point where, you know, people are starting to become more aware of it. The non-GMO movement has been really strong in the past few years. And I mean, and ideally, everybody would be having organic produce, and grass-fed, grass-finished meats and beef and pastured pork. I mean, we realize that that's not necessary for everyone, but there definitely is a list of the top crops that are definitely genetically modified and are sprayed with pesticides. And the best resource that we can provide is the Environmental Working Group. So every year they come out with a list of their Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And so they'll list on that little infographic. You can go on their website and even print out a little card that you can keep in your wallet when you go to the grocery store. But they will list which fruits and vegetables are the safest and have the least amount of pesticides. 
and which vegetables, if you're going to buy them, it's very, very important that you buy them organic. Yeah, and definitely check out episode number 17. So I interview uh, Zen Honeycutt. She's from Moms Across America. So she has been featured on network television as well as she's been lobbying and sort of really an activist to get the word out about how bad glyphosate is for our, our body and really, you know, spreading that message. So check out episode 17 and we really talking about how important it is to switch from organic for preconception health and really the health of your, your children. She has a personal story. Whenever I hear, I've heard it a couple of times when she tells it, it's just, it brings me to tears every time. So definitely check out episode 17 on that and you can kind of dig more into the why it's important to go organic and and non-GMO. And yeah, check out the Environmental Working Group. You can go to ewg.org. And yeah, they just released that, the list. And I think strawberries top the list as being like so bad. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have strawberries, please, please, please get, you know, make sure you get organic. They are just loaded with pesticides. For sure. And one rule of thumb that also is helpful if you're thinking about it, if a fruit or a vegetable does not have a thick outer skin, then you're going to imagine that if it's being sprayed with anything, it's going to easily absorb that spray. And so things like you said, strawberries and greens and leafy greens, those are easily going to absorb the toxins. And so you definitely want to go with organic whenever possible. Yeah. So really in in our couples coaching program, so that's a six month program where we work with couples to help and kind of make this, you know, using functional testing, using mindset shifts and looking at diet and lifestyle. One of the first places we start after we have them do a food sensitivity test is we have them do an elimination diet. While we wait wait for the results of the food sensitivity, we want to have them experience what it's like to remove these top allergens from your diet and see how good you can feel. Because sometimes you don't know how poorly you are feeling until you feel freaking awesome. So the elimination diet and food affects, you know, you and I, Brandy and I like differently. So it's important to go through the the steps because we've had people get a food sensitivity test and kind of go, oh, great, I can't have any of that stuff. And then it sometimes can just be a little overwhelming, even though we do recommend that as part of it. So we like to start with the elimination diet and we'll take you through here. So really it's taking out specific foods and we'll, we'll let you know what those are. And then you gradually reintroduce them, take the foods out for 10 days, and then you gradually reintroduce them over the course of 30 days. And Brandy, do you have anything to say before we we go forward on that? No. So the reason it's important that we do a food elimination diet is like you, Sarah said, if you don't take something out of your diet, you have no way of knowing how it was affecting you. And I've often gotten the question, you know, I took this food out and I reintroduced it and I really didn't feel anything. But one of the things to keep in mind, especially for the more common foods that are people are sensitive to or the more common foods that are genetically modified, that even if you take it out and although you may not feel a negative reaction, there's no way for us to be able to feel the internal inflammation that could be going on over a period of time. So it could be creating chaos internally and we may not feel it right away. And that's why we're always talking about the importance of non-GMO foods and organic foods, because even though you may not have a direct reaction, some of these genetically modified foods, especially corn, it's the most highly uh, Mm. GMO food, you may feel okay, but it can be causing symptoms internally that you're not aware of yet. Yeah. So as far as the foods you should avoid, so gluten in all forms, Brandy, Mm -hmm. you're celiac. Brandy has celiac disease and I have uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So for Brandy and I, gluten is definitely not a good idea. And even though we're in the middle of a gluten-free craze right now, there are a significant number of people that when they have gluten, it it causes problems. So that's one of the, the top allergens. Anything to say on that before we kind of go down the list? Yeah. And so many people, if they're not familiar with it, gluten is broad term and and a lot of people may not know what gluten includes, but there are a lot of grains that are gluten grains. And so that's wheat. So it's not just wheat, but things like barley and barley is, you know, in beer. So that's going to be included in it with another alcohol to think of would be rye or whiskey because that's derived from wheat. So when we say gluten, we're not just talking about, okay, you're going to take the bread and pasta out and maybe the cookies and crackers, but we're also talking about looking at things like drinks that you're eating, additives that could be in the processed food that you're eating. Even so much as supplements, you would be surprised that Mm -hmm. gluten is in a lot of supplements because it's a bulking agent. So if you're going to go gluten-free, you really have to look for all sources of gluten in your diet. 
yeah, your, your supplements, your medication. Yeah. So you're, so you're taking out gluten, you're taking out dairy, which is probably the toughest one that people say to us really, you know, cheese consumption has tripled over the last 30 years and people, you really, when you order a salad, you have to hold the cheese. So dairy is a really difficult one for people. And then really when you bring it back in, I have people be super honest with themselves because it'd be like, Ooh, okay. I was feeling a little phlegmy and that's, you might trick yourself, but that's a reaction. So dairy. Mm -hmm. There is a good reason that dairy is a hard thing for us to take out because dairy is very rewarding to the dopamine centers in our brain. And so it's really hard for us, you know, anybody who loves cheese or something like that. I mean, it makes you feel good when you eat it because it, it's hitting that reward center in our brains. And so it's almost addictive in a way. And I think that's why a lot of people have a lot of problems removing dairy, but it's one of the ones that if you can stick to it and you can remove it, you will very often, very quickly see reactions when you bring it back in. Definitely. And then eggs, which is another one kind of for some fertility friendly diets say to have lots of eggs, but eggs are a top allergen. And it's typically the egg white, right? That we're allergic to. Yep. It's the egg white most of the time that people are intolerant to. The yolks are generally easily tolerated by most people, but it's always good to take them out completely for the elimination diet. And then I recommend if you can, when you reintroduce eggs, start with the yolks to see how you feel and then add in the yolks and the egg whites. And then you'll be able to see if maybe it's just the whites that you're having issues with. If that's the case, but you can tolerate egg yolks, that's awesome because that's where most of the nutrition is anyways. The next one is corn, which again is one of the top genetically modified foods. So I've had people bring back in corn and this flares up their asthma and corn is something that I avoid. Yep, for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. And then peanuts is another one that we have you take out. And then the fall, the last one is soy. So there was a huge, when people, you know, switched away from non-dairy milk, sorry, from dairy milk, they went to a lot of soy milk, which then can have phytoestrogens and then that can play with your hormones and cause, and then also cause intolerance. Anything you wanted to say about soy? Yeah. And soy is actually very genetically modified as well. If you can tolerate it, there are some instances where soy can be okay. And that would definitely be organic fermented soy. Right. And that's really how soy is meant to be eaten. If you look at people in Asia, when they eat soy, they kind of use it as a condiment and they use it in a fermented form and they don't eat it at every meal. They're not having soy crisps and soy milk and tofu and mm -hmm. <laughs> with everything they eat. It's just a light condiment that they bring in and it's usually organic and fermented. Yeah, something like miso, it's good. Mm -hmm. Another one, so these are come some of the other little ones to, to, to look at. So you really become a food detective while you're on this elimination diet. So food colorings, uh, yellow number six, red number 40, like some of those ones, those food colorings, which in processed foods, they show up a lot. So you really want to avoid those food additives and preservatives and also processed sugar. So that is not on the elimination diet as well. So you're taking out processed sugar. So you can, you know, swap in some maple syrup or some organic honey. So it's not like you won't have any sweet treats unless you do have an insulin issue going on. Then you probably want to look at um, an organic stevia or xylitol or is it monk fruit? What were some monk other fruit. ones? Yeah. yeah. And sugar, like you said, there's the two reasons. One of them is the blood sugar issue. We don't want to be having a whole ton of sugar and causing our blood sugar to go up and down constantly throughout the day. But sugar, conventional sugar, is actually very highly processed and it's genetically modified. So two reasons why eliminating processed sugar as much as possible is going to be important. Yeah. So those sugar beets, again, you've got genetically modified. So some of the top genetically modified foods. So we have corn, like we talked about soy, we talked about the sugar beets, canola oil, which is in a lot of chips and those sort of things, cottonseed oil, alfalfa, kini, yellow squash, papaya from China and Hawaii. Make sure you choose organic there. And also you want to make sure you avoid artificial sweeteners because those can create anxiety and have difficulty sleeping and you really want to avoid those. Anything on the artificial sweeteners? Yeah. So, I mean, they are, like you said, they're, they're neuro excitatory. So they do have an effect on the brain. They're also very disrupting to the gut microbiome and, and your gut. So things like Splenda or sucralose. So that is another name for Splenda. And it's in a lot of low carb foods or sugar-free foods and things like sweet and low. Those are actually shown to cause issues with the gut 
And in fact, um, there are some of these low carb sweeteners that even though they're no calorie, they do have an effect on your blood sugar and your insulin. So it's really important to, to watch out for those. And if you are going to stick to something that's non-nutritive or zero calorie or artificial sweetener, um, like Sarah said, Splenda is a great option. Uh, monk fruit and erythritol would be another one that I would recommend. But if you have issues with gas and bloating, you may find that monk fruit and erythritol cause that to be worse. So you have to do a little bit of experimenting. And then again, some of the natural sweeteners are okay in moderation. So things like raw honey, maple syrup, um, those, and even dates, there's a lot of things like date sugars out there, which you can use as an alternative. But again, moderation is important. Yeah, I think you inadvertently said Splenda, so it's Stevia that is recommended. Splenda is not recommended. <laughs> right, sorry, Stevia, you are yeah. correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eating for your fertility does not have to suck, and it is not about deprivation. It's eating food that tastes amazing and nourishes your body as you prepare for pregnancy success. I'm excited to announce that our summer fertility recipe guide is here Go to fertilitydietfreebie.com. That's fertilitydietfreebie.com to grab your copy. I have worked with a chef with a nutrition background to prepare these summer recipes. This is a five-day challenge where you'll learn how food impacts your body while enjoying delicious foods. So this is not about you drinking green juice all day long and starving. Uh, it is about eating awesome foods. It includes a meal plan and a grocery shopping list. Start this challenge with your partner today. All you need to do is go to fertilitydietfreebie.com. That's fertilitydietfreebie.com to grab your summer fertility recipe guide. High fructose corn syrup. Stay away from that stuff because that is not good. And okay. that's in everything in the yes. U.S. So you really have to be good at reading your labels. And it's in things from ketchups to salad dressings to... You barbecue name sauce, it. yeah. It's barbecue like, sauce, it's in everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you may be saying, okay, wait a minute, that's a lot of stuff. What am I going to eat? Really, it's almost like just to look at, you know, shopping the periphery of the grocery store. It's kind of by that um, Michael Pollan. It's Pollan or Pollan, I always want to say his name wrong, but Pollan, yeah, from the food, food rules. You know, if your great grandmother is like, what is that? You don't want to eat it. So really, you know, what will you eat? So we're looking at grass-fed meat, wild-caught fish, organic poultry, you know, looking at fruits, you want berries and green apples, so low glycemic fruits, lots of veggies, lots of green vegetables, kale and collard greens, Swiss chard, organic rice, legumes, except you don't want to do peanuts, nuts and seeds, and any of those non-gluten grains like millet or quinoa or amaranth. Yep. So essentially, basically, you know, plants and meats and Back to the basics and anything that doesn't come in a box or has a nutrition label on it, you know, you're probably good to go with those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then the next part of the phase is so basically you're taking those, all those foods out for 10 days and then just know in the beginning when you take it out, probably for the first three or four days, don't plan anything too strenuous. You could have withdrawal symptoms. You could feel headachey and fatiguey and are sort of fatigued. So you may not feel that great. So just kind of be aware of that. We'll go on to a little bit about some detox reactions a little bit later. But as far as the food challenge, so you take it out for 10 days and then you systematically begin to reintroduce it. And there's a, a protocol here, the order of reintroduction. So you bring back corn in first and you want to make sure that it's organic and non-GMO and you're having it three times a day. Now, if you have any immediate reaction, you would stop taking it. And then you're going to get out your little food journal. You can go to the Fab Fertile Support Group and in the files info section of that group, there's a symptom checklist and you can download that little form. And so if, if you bring back in corn and you're like, ooh, my digestion goes funny or wait a minute, I have some gas or some burping or my mood goes funny, you know, there's all those symptoms are on this checklist. So you can use that. So really you're bringing back in corn, then you're going to bring back in peanuts unless you have a known allergy to peanuts or mold. Then you're going to bring back in eggs. So you want to make sure organic and free range. Soy, you might want to, you may not want to bring this back in, but if you do bring it back in, it's like we talked about bringing back in miso or tempeh. And then you want to uh, bring back in dairy. Always want to go for um, organic grass fed. And then gluten, you're not going to bring back in unless you have a um, autoimmune condition, then you won't bring gluten back in. Otherwise you will. And I actually recommend, to be honest with gluten, there it's really 
if you can avoid it, it's not necessary to bring it back in. I, I think mm-hmm. most people would do well with avoiding it as much as possible. That's right. But it's always good to try it just to see on that occasion. You know, if you want to go and have a beer every once in a while, you want to be able to see if you'll be able to tolerate it. Mm-hmm. Like we always recommend as a minimum, take out dairy and gluten for 60 days. So that's kind of the order of reintroduction. So the it's really this is not a long-term thing. This elimination diet is for you to specifically know how food impacts your body. So it's a, it's a short, short-term short program. You're not on it for, for months and months. But the most crucial part of the elimination diet is the reintroduction and you getting out that symptom checklist, getting out your food diary and recording all your symptoms. Because if you miss that part, and I even like when we work with clients, we have them write it down, show us what it is, because in a, maybe in the next week when they're out, decide they want to have dairy again, I bring out the list. Remember, you told me that you felt this way. You know, remember when you told me you brought back in corn, you felt that way, because it can suck sometimes when it's our favorite foods. But, you know, again, your body is telling you something, it's giving you some clues. And for us to really listen to it and record very diligently what it is, because this is the whole point of an elimination diet, it's to, to know how the food impacts your body. Yeah. And that's why it's important to, to write it down and be honest with yourself. And the one thing to remember about bringing these back in is you may not have a reaction right away. You may have a reaction the next day. Mm -hmm. So if you have been, you've been doing the elimination diet and your sleep has been really great and nothing else has changed. And let's say you bring back in corn And the next, you know, that night you just don't sleep well. And then the next day you wake up and you have brain fog and you just feel like you can't function. That's a sign that your body was not tolerating that cord correctly. It could even be so much as maybe you get a headache or all of a sudden your skin starts getting itchy or you have acne pop up. Again, that could happen a day or two after you've reintroduced the food. And so that's why we have you reintroduce one food at a time over a couple of days. So you can really see if there's anything that comes up. And that's where you, like Sarah said, you need to be honest with yourself and journal it so that you can see this really is causing a problem and I do need to avoid it. And when you do the elimination diet, you want to make sure that you're not planning it around a vacation time or special events. If you've got weddings or parties coming up, Having said that, there really is no perfect time, but you want to make sure that you can 100% commit to it because it really is that 30-day period where you're really listening to your body. And I'm just going to touch right now on going gluten light and dairy light and really why that's not going to work. Brandy, can you dig into that for us? Yeah. So, I mean, gluten light or dairy light, it's the same thing as being, well, I'm kind of pregnant, but I'm kind of not. You either are or you aren't. (laughs) So... If you're going to eliminate gluten, you have to do it all the way because if you don't remove it completely from your diet and give your body a break from actually having it in your system, because it takes time for your body to kind of calm down a little bit from you having it all of the time, you're never going to be able to get a true feel for how well your body does or doesn't do with that food. And the same is true for dairy. You really do have to commit for, I mean, it's 10 days, like Sarah said, we're not asking you to do it for three months, 10 days, be really diligent, take it out so that you do give your body that opportunity to realize that there's no more gluten in the system, calm the immune system down so that when you reintroduce it, you will be able to know for sure whether or not you're having a reaction. Right. Because if you don't take it out totally, it's still a little bit's coming in and the inflammation never really goes away. If you do find your sense into it and you actually have some, it takes a while for your body to heal. You could have some the inflammation could go on for a number of weeks, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, months, actually. So depending yeah. on how sensitive you are, like somebody who has celiac disease, in my instance, if I get cross-contaminated with a little bit of gluten, it could take months to heal the gut from that exposure because it activates the immune system and puts it on high alert. And it really takes the body time. And that's where when you're looking at doing the healing process, you have to be patient. You can't expect things to happen overnight. It's a process and you need to be patient, but it's definitely worth it. And that's why it's important that if you're going to do it, you have to be 100% committed to going through the process. Yeah. And typically if you are sensitive to gluten, you potentially could be sensitive to dairy as well because of the casein in dairy as people think it's lactose, which is the sugar. Whereas it's casing the, the, the protein in dairy that people have problems with. 
And yes, and we see that a lot. And the thing with gluten too, if you are sensitive to it, depending on how severely sensitive, you could be sensitive to gluten cross reactors, which is something we haven't gotten into. But there are different foods that have a similar protein structure to gluten and so mimic the proteins of gluten in your body and your immune system confuses it and thinks that it's gluten. So if you've eliminated gluten and dairy and you're having some other grains like oats, coffee is actually another very common cross-reactor to gluten. Chocolate is a cross-reactor to gluten. You may still have symptoms like headachey or brain fog or joint pain. That's when you might want to look at what are some cross reactors and let's eliminate those for a period of time and see if that helps. And that's where it's important to work with a trained professional on this because it's sort of, it can be overwhelming. You're like, I don't even know what's going on here. So it's because mm-hmm. you can take it, so there's going gluten-free and then the cross, if there is perhaps not like myself, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, then you could have issues with cross reactors. And then we, we talked about before with, you know, in the beginning phases of the elimination diet, as you take these things out, you may have some detox symptoms such as nausea, fatigue, diarrhea, skin rashes, eczema, acne. Anything you wanted to say about that? Mood swings. So you can definitely feel like your mood is off, inability to concentrate. Those are all really common um, detox reactions when you're removing some of these foods from your body, especially in the case of like gluten or dairy or even sugar that can that can cause a dopamine hit to your brain to that that pleasure center in the brain that makes it a little bit addictive um, you will definitely have some detox symptoms even things like hot and cold so your inability to regulate your temperature for a day or two or being clammy and sweaty those are all things that can happen and they do get better over time And that's why it's important, like Sarah said, if you're going to do this, try not to do it when you have a big event coming up or a vacation, because you want to be able to know that if you're going through these symptoms, you can go have a nap if you need to have a nap or do a little bit of extra self-care so that you can get through it and start feeling better in a few days. Mm -hmm. And know that you might crave these foods like crazy. So just to make sure, and because so the elimination diet is not about starvation or deprivation. You are still eating like beautiful foods and you're, you're not starving. It's not a juice cleanse or any of that stuff. It's a specific protocol to figure out what potentially you could be intolerant or sensitive to. So you will not be hungry. So it's just make sure that you've shopped and make sure you have a lot of food around for you, but just know that you could start craving large loaves of bread. Not to say that you couldn't then have gluten-free bread, but just to be aware of that. (laughs) Yep. And that's definitely something that, you know, especially in the first couple of days, if once you get past, you know, day three or four, things tend to get a lot better and a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And then I guess some of the negative detox reactions, like with the liver and stuff like that, did you want to go into how to support the liver and during the elimination diet? Sure. So, I mean, we are exposed to a lot of toxins in our environment right now all of the time. And one of the main jobs of our liver is to kind of filter those toxins and detoxify them and get them out of the body. And so if you're somebody that has a liver that's already overburdened and you take out these foods, you could have what we call a Herxheimer reaction, which is essentially the same thing as a detox reaction. And so you may feel things a little more severe than other people would. And so that could be an indication that you need to support your detox pathways by making sure that you're eliminating every day. So you're drinking plenty of water so that you're urinating enough. You want to make sure that you're not constipated. You definitely want to make sure that you're having bowel movements every day because if that's not happening, it's kind of building up the toxins in your body and you're going to feel worse. And then some other things that you can do to support detoxification is things like Epsom salt bath, dry skin brushing, things like dandelion and bitter green. So you can either do a dandelion tea or you could do dandelion greens. Those are kind of a bitter green. There's some other bitter greens that would work as well. Those are really helpful for the liver. And then something like milk thistle, which is known to help the liver and support the liver as well. And again, you can get milk thistle either in a capsule or in a tea, but those are some things that are gonna help you keep those detox pathways open, which is really important, especially when you're going through an elimination diet and if you're having some negative reactions. Yeah, the Epsom salt, you just want, you can get that at your your local health food store and really just take a cup of 
Epsom salts, you can ask, also do some Himalayan salts in there and throw in, if you want to throw in some essential oils like lavender or something else that you enjoy and put that in the bath. And that's really relaxing and then also helps with uh, magnesium as well. Mm-hmm. And one of the other things that I wanted to mention too is that if you are having these reactions, especially if the fatigue, you may not feel up to exercising, which is totally fine, but it is still important for you to move. Because if you're not moving, you're not moving your lymph. And the lymph is a system of vessels throughout the body that carries waste products. And so it doesn't have a heart like our circulatory system does for our blood to pump it. So we have to be moving to move that lymph. And that's why dry skin brushing is very helpful. But walking is also very lymphatic. So if you only have the energy just to go out and do a walk, that's fine. It, it's it's actually probably a really good idea to to do that because you're getting the fresh air, you're moving your lymph and you're kind of helping things move along. Mm -hmm. Rebounding is a good one too. Jumping on the little the little trampoline if you have one of those guys. But yeah, and also the 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 dry skin brushing. I've just gotten into a routine where I do that every morning before I I get in the shower, just have a little brush of the skin, get rid of the the toxins that way. Anything else, Brandy, you wanted to add? No, I think it's I think it's a good idea for everybody to at least once do an elimination diet just to see how these foods are affecting them. It might be a good place for you to start if you're having the the standard North American diet and you've never done something like this. This is a good thing to start with so you can see if how the food is affecting you. And maybe, you know, get a partner on board with you, do it at the same time, and then it can give you some insights and some motivation to maybe make some changes that you may need to start making to make improvements in your health and contribute towards improving fertility because every little step that you take is helpful and, and I think it's a good idea that everybody tries this at least once. Exactly. To me, this is super empowering. This is how I discovered my tolerant to dairy, gluten, and corn. And, you know, I discovered it years and years later. I was fully in menopause. So if you're still cycling and you still have a period, there's things we can do. And starting, you know, looking at the elimination diet and then looking at other functional tests and there's things that we, we layer in. But this is just a really good starting point for you to, to, to kick this thing off and just for you to really realize how important what you place on your fork every day really is. So awesome. It's, yeah. yeah. So. I was just going to say, it's extremely important. And it's going to set you up for healthy pregnancy, healthy postpartum, and then it also helps set you up to be a good role model to your kids in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast again, Brandy. I love talking about this topic. It's just one of my, my passions. I would like to invite you and your partner to a supercharge your fertility discovery call. This call is for you if you meet at least one of the following criteria. You've been trying to get pregnant for at least two years. You've been through at least one failed IUI or IVF. This call is for action takers. If you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. If you're seriously considering work with us, go to fabfertile.com. That's F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on apply here. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on apply here then you'll be booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.